The further we push up the Douro, the more isolated it seems, but no matter how secluded the villages are, the influences are similar. There's always a reminder of Portugal's nautical history. There's always the opulent presence of some bygone nobility or count or duke. And no matter how strapped or destitute times may have been for the villagers, there's always the reminder of the unbridled, almost obscene wealth of the church dripping, oozing from every chapel and cathedral. Oh, and there's port. Port is everywhere. Everybody makes a port. There's port ahead of us, there's port behind us, there's port to starboard, there's port to port. Scenic has given us the adventure of a lifetime, kicking off in the capital Lisbon before heading to the lively little city of Porto to embark on their unforgettable Douro River cruise. We've been wined and dined and we've explored this incredible region, all the while luxuriating in between stops on our fabulous floating hotel, Scenic Azure. This week we've hit the heart of port wine country in Pinhau. From here, we'll head west along the Douro back to Porto to bid adios to Portugal and hola to Spain, where we'll wind up this wonderful journey in its capital, Madrid. Having sliced its way up the River Douro, the scenic azure has delivered us here. This is classic Portugal. This is the kind of village where you expect Clint Eastwood to ride in on his horse, an echoing whistle as his soundtrack. This is Portuguese spaghetti western. Time hasn't stood still here, it simply got up and marched off. This is the kind of village where you want to tie your mule to a vine, kick off your spurs and soak in a bathtub full of the famed port, with your hat on of course. The history of the town dates back to the Middle Ages? Yes, in the beginning. Yes, the name of Provzent. It was the name of a warrior. He died taking care of the people who lived in this right. village. Right. And then after that, you have the big families from the port wine until now, 21st century, that only lives 300 people, but in the old times it was more than 1,500, right. yes. So it was real agricultural yes. centre. Yes. Yeah. yes, 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 yes. And lots of wealth. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It always amazes me when you see the front of a church like this and it's quite grey and simple and you come inside and you see all this wealth. Yes. Where does the wealth come from? From this village. Since the 16th century, they start to build houses, manor houses here, until the, the 19th century. And all together, start to be one of the most richest village here in Douro Valley. Yeah. And uh, they start to collect, so it was normal, to collect money from the houses, from the family houses, to build their own church. Yeah. You can see five altars in gold, Robber's End is the Portugal of yesteryear. These days, other than its epic vistas, its claim to fame is its bread and, of course, port. Operating since the early 1900s, the town's bakery was built with the remains of an olive press. Breaking bread with newcomers is a Portuguese tradition, one that I'm happy to oblige. I think in Douro Valley, I'm sure, we always like to receive our friends with a glass of wine and something to eat. And here we still have the old bakery that I show you already. Mm. And uh, they cook it in the oven, then you take the ashes out and you cook it in your house, everything that you want in the meat, in, in, in between, in the middle. You really know how to um, live life and enjoy life, don't you? Yes. New Portuguese. Like I told you, we have a space for you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm coming, <laughs> I'm moving in. Our scenic guide, Manuel, lives on the western edge of town in this grand and historic manor house. Built in 1680, it's been home to generations of his family ever since. Visitors are graciously invited to explore the upstairs living quarters, still in their original state, 
while part of the property has now been transformed into guest accommodation. Why is this area so good for the port grape? Uh, I think you have to ask to God why he did God. that. <laughs> yes. So, so yes. the port is God's work? Yes, yes, I think, <laughs> and the man helps. To God? Yes. <laughs> The starting point for all great wines is a great vineyard and Quinta Daroda is revered as one of the best. Home to some of the oldest vineyards in the Douro Valley, the estate is as beautiful as it is historic and the finest of the port wines are produced right here. It's the best in the region? Oh, absolutely. The best port wine is the Croft port wine, right, completely. Right. And how long, have, so how long has Croft's been here? Croft started activity in 1588. 1588? Yes, the most holder in all the Douro Valley. Yeah. Uh, initially just to transport, transport family port shippers, yep. to transport to port wine to uh, United Kingdom, for oh, example. So, so they, they transported down yes, the river? Yes, yes. And then they started no, just, making... Just to Porto and, of course, later in the, Into, the, yes. around the world? Yes, exactly. This looks like a very rugged spot to grow vines. Yes, this is very old vines with a hundred years, okay? Uh, traditional vines, the space between the lines small, yeah. so what does this mean? The density of the vine is small too. About the quantities here, importantly, we can find, we can have big quantities, but the quality here, it's always amazing. Okay, so not a lot of grapes, but really good quality. Yes, good and, quality. And hand tended, there's no machinery going no in there. No machines, exactly. Generally, the good grapes, the fantastic grapes we use from the traditional vineyards, Vinhas Velhas, the Portuguese name, to produce our best vintage port wine. So the amazing, a great, great quality right. always. And you can be the judge of that yourself. Our included visit with Scenic does, of course, come with complimentary tastings. So what do we have here? So here we have the cropped pink, the first rosé port wine in Old Oro Valley created by the Croft Company in 2008, so we can say it's a young wine. Yeah. This is a different wine, because generally people think port wine just one, one color, one aroma, one style. This is not so true, and this is a good example. Mm. Cheers. <laughs> good? That is lively and fruity, isn't it? Yes, completely. Yeah. Very good. What's the second one? The second one, it's the Tennis Ottoni. In this case, this is a very intense and complex port wine. It's like a well-oiled hinge. <laughs> <laughs> and long flavor in your mouth, certainly. Mm. Oh, Good. That's a big body, syrupy. Yeah. We don't forget the flavor. Um, so quickly. No. Yeah, it long time. Lingers. Yeah. It lingers, doesn't it? Stay. Back on board Scenic Azure, and this region of Pinhao provides the perfect dreamy Douro backdrop to a lazy afternoon on board. Why do you enjoy cruising so much? Relaxing. Yeah. Having someone else make all the decisions. This yeah. is not your first cruise with Scenic, is it? No, uh, and it won't be the last. I think the, uh, the personnel are fantastic, they're friendly, they're helpful, and, uh, and the food's sensational. Yeah. And, as we've come to expect, there's never long between drinks and delights. And tonight, I've been invited to Scenic Door, the onboard degustation restaurant. For us, Double Door, it's a fine dining experience. So tonight, you will have the chance to try seven different, different courses. Dining on board is an experience in itself, one delicious dish after another cheerfully served up at one of the ship's restaurants, or, if you'd prefer, in the comfort of your own suite. And for the lively ones, there's always a few, there's a dedicated onboard musician as well as special events to make sure guests are entertained well into the evening. Tonight's is something truly impressive, a private Fado performance just for us. Fado is the traditional music of Portugal and its melancholic melodies have been linked to this country's musical history for centuries.
Our cruise with Scenic through Portugal has taken us almost to the Spanish border and now back again to Porto, where we'll disembark this fair dame of the Douro and explore some more of this intriguing port city. As well travelled as I may appear to be, and as prone as I am to never letting the facts get in the way of a good story, I would never have dreamt up a link between Porto, Harry Potter and Hogwarts. I mean, how could a bespectacled, nerdy little English wizard chap possibly have a connection to such a cool, chilled and swaggering place such as this? In 1906, this bookstore was designed as a temple to books, as a temple to education. J.K. Rowling, author of Harry Potter, taught in Porto. She taught English to students in black capes. She came to this bookstore. It inspired her. This stop is now top of the list for every literary lover that steps foot in the city. As well as stocking a treasured collection of books from around the world, the store itself is a lovely spectacle. But many of Porto's treasures are hidden where you least expect it. My goodness, that's quite a statement, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's beautiful. And these are the traditional Portuguese tiles? It's a traditional call that we start to use in 18, but everything is traditional. This is one of Porto's major train stations, and its tiles depict centuries of the country's history. So you can travel back in time without ever leaving the station. History is there and here. Yeah. Here, as you can see, is just life. People, ethnography, yeah. religion, yeah. wine. And, 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 and why is it coloured up the top? Because it's the evolution of the transportation and port history since the Roman times, the Visigoths, oh, till okay. the arrival of the train again right. in 19th Also, oh, the evolution of public transport. Yes. For us, it's time to say a fond farewell to the luxurious scenic azure and the epic sights of the Douro and head across the border to wind up this incredible journey in the Spanish capital of Madrid. For a major metropolis, Madrid remains a very livable city. There are a lot of people outdoors. Do you have an outdoor lifestyle in Madrid? Yes, yes, absolutely. We spend uh, almost the weekends outside, no? Like in this park, for example. We like to enjoy the sun, have a drink. Yeah, have a drink, and then you spend a lot of time in the evenings. Yeah, <laughs> sometimes from, <laughs> from the lunch time, during all the evening long, and also the night, yeah. you know? Those madrileños sure do love their leisure time, and Retiro Park is one of their favourite places to indulge. Very manicured gardens, aren't they? Yes, French garden style. French style? Yes. Modelled on the gardens of Versailles? Exactly, yes, that's the idea. Yeah. And why were, they the, why were they here? Well, because this was the private gardens, of a royal palace that used to be located over there. Before it got bombed, yes, destroyed. Destroyed during the, a war against the French troop of Napoleon. With over 140 hectares of parklands and ponds on the edge of the city, Retiro is a popular stop for tourists and something of an oasis for locals. You could easily spend half a day here, exploring everything from its gardens to the magnificent Crystal Palace and even one of Spain's oldest trees. So, how old is it? This is from the 1633. Nearly 400 years old? Exactly. How has it survived? Well, it survived because the uh, army of the French troops of Napoleon decided to use it to place the canyons 
they're facing. Ah, oh, so they the put city. the cannons in the tree. Exactly. So, so they wiped time. out the palace that was there. Exactly, the royal palace was there. But because the cannons were here, the tree <laughs> survived. Yes. So I used to think it was good to be king, but it's better <laughs> to be a tree. Yes, exactly. The final stop in our journey with Scenic has taken us through Portugal's Douro Valley and now across the border into Spain. It doesn't take long to realise that Madrid is old. It's got relics, it's got medieval buildings, it's got palaces everywhere. But don't be misled by the historic. It's also very artistic, it's hedonistic, it's gastronomic. With winters that hover near zero and summers of blistering heat, Madrid and its inhabitants, the Madrileños, require constant comfort and constant quenching. Is it any wonder that this city is regarded as one of the liveliest cities in the world? Madrid operates at full bore and on a full tank. As with all cities in Spain, Madrid's heart is the Plaza Mayor, roughly translated as the main square, home to almost five centuries of history. Madrid's Plaza Mayor has been everything from a marketplace to a bullring and even an execution square. But what happens here now? So this is still, uh, this is still important to Madrilenos? Very, very important. In fact, it's very crowded, as you can see. Who is the uh, gentleman on horseback in the centre of your Plaza Mayor? Okay, so he is the King Philip III. Philip III. From the Habsburg dynasty, Los Austrias. Ah, yeah, the Habsburgs, right. And, and why is he here? Because he was the one who decided to build this square. Just steps away from Plaza Mayor is Madrid's oldest and liveliest market. The San Miguel marketplace has all the Spanish delights you've been dreaming of including its most popular culinary pastime. And why is tapas such a popular meal? Well, because, you know, it's a way of living. We go out from one bar to another, we order one drink, then you take us one tapa there, and after you change, you go to another bar, you ask for another drink, and another tapa, and so on. So it's just, it's, it's just a way to have an endless party with. Yeah, yeah. What's the convenience? What's the convenience? Olives, very traditional. Let olives and olive happen. oil. In exactly. fact, Spain, I think, is what the greatest producer of olive oil in the world. Exactly. So everything's got olive oil. This is a very good combination: the vinegar of the olives and the and the pickles with the sangria. Mm. While Madrid's reputation for leisure time and revelry precedes it, it's also a city with a fascinating history and many architectural marvels. One of the grandest of all is the Royal Palace, today's included scenic free choice activity. Built during the 18th and 19th centuries, it was decorated to the tastes of King Charles III and is as lavish inside as it is out. Of all the advantages a scenic river cruise has to offer, the luxury, the comfort, the convenience, the calm that descends due to a gentle float upon untroubled waters, it's the ability to place yourself into a slice of life you wouldn't otherwise have access to that probably appeals the most. It's the landscape, it's the agriculture, it's the locals at work. You get to see what makes a place tick. But then, as a magnificent contrast, to be able to leave the ship altogether and immerse yourself into a thumping, heaving metropolis such as Madrid, well then, that's just the icing on the cake. That's the cream in the pastry. La Pepito da Crema.